reader is Tom Bay. Anyway, I'll fill in for you. Speaking of devil. Yes. Well, I should add that we are being recorded tonight. If anybody does not want to be recorded, the camera can be turned off during your segment. <coughs> Might have a couple of dirty words in here, but <laughs> not, nothing too bad. Uh, as some of you that have been to some of these readings with, with me, you know that I sometimes read from a piece of the novel that I've I've written and we're trying to get it edited and da 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 da. And part of it is from a little series of writings that I've put together called Bits and Pieces of My Life. They're true stories. I started out when I was like two, trying to get potty trained, and the last one was the uh, great theft of the chicken. Uh, they're in a process of trying to take me. Uh, into to Vietnam and I'm, I'm kind of easing into that I'm getting a little more comfortable with it uh, it's the the memoirs of a warrior wannabe and the last one I could say was the episode where we stole the chicken and uh, now moving on fast forward to my freshman year in high school and for some reason I'm in an advanced English class I don't even know how to conjugate a verb. It's a long year. I fall in love again, this time with a very pretty brunette in my class who just happens to be the girlfriend of the starting center for the football team. If it hadn't been for my older brother, her boyfriend would have killed me, I'm sure. But to be a warrior, you have to know how to struggle. And struggle I did through high school, with girls, with sports, and life in general. I took another pretty brunette to my junior prom and wound up fighting her damn boyfriend. <laughs> if it hadn't have been for a few lucky punches to his left eye, the big gorilla probably would have beat me to death. I started as a small but mean defensive end, and you know, fairly good. But my senior year, I found cheerleaders and alcohol and uh, pretty well this is starting consequently I think I've been trying to make up for that mistake all my life but life moves on and I finally started dating a girl another brunette that didn't have a boyfriend and managed to graduate from high school although far down my class my chances of becoming a warrior were slowly dwindling when I realized hey there's a war going on. That's it. I'll join the Army. Especially since my SAT scores were legendarily low. One day in early November of 66, after shooting pool for a few hours, me and a couple of my buddies went to see the Army recruiter and planned on joining under the buddy system. Great. Signed up for Airborne Infantry. hoo -ah. We jumped on the butts, went to Knoxville, and took the physical. My two buddies were accepted, me, 2F, I had a hernia, who knew? Uh, I still had, I can still hear my friends cussing me as their bus drove off towards Fort Benning. There was still hope though, remember mom, mom was a nurse, and I had her schedule her surgery the next week. My path to warriordom was still open. <coughs> Basic was fairly easy. I've been in the precision drill team in, in uh, high school, so the manual of arms was no sweat, and I was in pretty good shape, so I graduated seventh in my class. I'd taken a test for OCS, and again, who would have guessed, I passed. Going to be an airborne infantry second lieutenant. Scary. Towards the end of basic, my drill instructors, Staff Sergeant Williams from Asheville, actually, pulled me aside and said, Baker, when you get to Nam, you do know that you're going to go, they're going to send you to Nam, don't you? Yes, Drill Sergeant, I believe that I can lead men in combat. Pretty bold statement coming from an 18-year-old. Maybe just dumb. Huh, he grunted, rolling his eyes. Well, when you get to Nam, you hide behind your platoon sergeant, 
and let him run the outfit for a couple of months. If you live through the first two months, then you step out and start running the platoon. Be a platoon leader, but not before. If you think you can run the outfit before, you're wrong. You will get people killed. Trust me, I've seen it happen. Now get the hell out of my face. Yes, drill sergeant, I shouted and ran like hell to get away from him, but I took his words to heart and was soon headed to advanced infantry training at Fort Dix with a busload of other warrior wannabes. I was getting closer. So I'm just, it's been funny, the pieces have been funny in the past, but it's just now starting to get a little serious. And as I, as I write and read in the future, you can feel the, the swing a little bit. I want to read you one little piece from the novel that reflects some of the stuff that, that occurred right before I left Nam. Uh, traditionally, the first calf, if you survived as a door gunner uh, and you had two weeks left in country, they let you quit flying and uh, they'd find something for you to do. But uh, in, in the novel, uh, the entire first cab was low on pilots. And David Lee, who was one of the heroes in the, in the novel, a warrior, volunteered to fly a resupply mission to a besieged fire base at the foot of Dewey Baden. This is true, this happened. Dewey, da Dewey Baden Mountain, Black Virgin Mountain. On top of the mountain, a uh, observation post had been run overrun during the night and the VC were lobbing mortars down on the fire base below. Both David and his door gunner, me, were short, very short. Ironically, the gunner was his old friend from the medevac company, Buxar and Tom Baker. And uh, the gunships uh, couldn't roll in hot on the mortars because they might have been some people survived the, the uh, uh, you know, when they took the outpost over, they might have survived, so they couldn't roll in hot, and, and they were just lobbing mortars down to us. There were 10 resupply choppers circling the fire base in a stacked traffic pattern. David's chopper was going to be the sixth one in. His gut told him that this was bad business as he watched helplessly while the mortars slammed into the area where they were to touch down and unload their cargo of food, water, and ammunition. I'm, and this, this is true. I'm too damn short for this shit, growled Baker as he fidgeted us with his 60. I had three days left in country. His stomach churned as he watched the mortars walk towards the chopper waiting to be offloaded. The red dust swirled under the rotor blades as the grunts rushed about trying to get the cargo that was literally being thrown out of the chopper. The shock and the concussion from the near misses of the mortars were shaking the earth until their feet, as their feet labored. Ten minutes later, it was their turn to go in. David dropped the chopper down quickly on the spot where the grunt pointed and left the engine wide open. Baker, I locked eyes for a brief second for one of the grunts that was taking the ammo back. A young black kid who shouted, "Don't mean nothing." It was a, it was kind of a, a motto phrase. Don't mean nothing. No matter how much shit you got into, don't mean nothing. As he grabbed an ammo box and tore off towards the bunker, sweat rolled out from under Baker's helmet as he tossed out ammo boxes. All the while, repeating the phrase, "Don't mean nothing." After all the ammo was unloaded, he turned to the food and the water. Food a luxury, but they could they would need the water. Thirty seconds later, later, Baker shouted, "Go, go, go!" and threw the last box of sea rations onto the pile before collapsing back into the centerfold seat. His M60 dangling from its cord. David shoved the cycle forward and pulled all the power the Huey could produce. His mortars thumped and walked her away. The chopper had just responded to the cyclic shift when a four point deuce mortar round hit five feet in front of the charging Huey. Now in real life it hit five feet behind us. In, in the story I had to take the hero out, but uh, it hit 
right behind us. Uh, like I say, in real life, the mortar hit just behind us. And uh, the young black kid was, was in that, that pile where the mortar hit. Uh, that, I'm struggling a little bit here, but uh, that, that was an actual happening. And uh, so um, the, the novel gave me an opportunity to state some of that in a little less personal note. So there you go. Thank you. time to be here. So. Thank you for listening. Um, I have three poems to share. Um, the first one is called the, On the Sparrow. What secrets do sparrows keep wrapped in their tiny quick hearts, soft with feather linings? What small accomplishments, looking to all the world like nothing at all? Do they chirp to one another in high, short melodies, diving amongst the leaves and the sun shadow flashes? Do the diligent honeybees humming from petal to pollen overhear their laments as they soar and dive? Triangular wings and darting, curving paths, breathtaking skill we never take time to see. Do they know upstairs, leaning out her cloud window, there is one who is clapping and laughing with raw joy, her eye upon every wing beat, each small perfect beak cracking seeds, all the little grasping feet. The second one is called One Thing. Who thought of the tick, the talk, the plumb bob swinging left and right, with tooth upon tooth biting out this ridiculous straight line? Hands think to grasp, showing strength and mastery over the wildest of all the creatures, as if the untamable were coiled inside a wooden box stuck to the wall, or a tiny silver chest tied to a wrist. We name it label it with numbers and marks, force it into small circles that wear themselves out, marching in the same curved path over and over and over. We claim it needs us to twist the stem of this little flower we carry or tiny cylinders to force its measure. The then and the was and the will be and the has been. But this beautiful monster, grander and deeper than the wisest imagination, is only one thing. It laughs and defies our measures and restraints, sharing its secrets only with light, painting pantomime shadows on our memories and plans, for it is only ever now. And the last one is the Fisher King. The Fisher King glides through currents of air, coursing through the breath as it moves over the waters. Wings spread as wide as an angel's, so wide, stretching to embrace the river bank to bank. Ash gray and snow white feathers ripple in the wind like laughter ruffling through silence. The men in bulky green and brown layers and weighted down to master earth slog through rock and mud and turn envious gazes on the king. They seek a glimpse of the god beneath the surface and search for even a flicker of light below. Their eyes accustomed to staring into the dark landscape beneath their feet, squeeze to slits as they face the morning sun to watch the great gray-white bird slice through the air like a wraith in mist. Cast and cast little pretend pieces of nature, luring and begging and courting the foreign flashes from beneath the water's current. A cunning tale, the men tell the fish, but stilted and laborious deceivers, they stand above, apart, and desperately seeking. But the bird and the wind and the water and the fish are all one movement. Thank you.
this one's gonna be a little dark because it's actually kind of an analysis of a movie that every day I start seeing its um, plot kind of becoming more and more real. And I, after that, even though I'm gonna spoil pretty much what the movie is about, I said I really recommend watching the movie. Just I mean, it's short, but it's one of those things where if you don't think you can cry at something like this, you will. Okay. Why is the future so frightening? Is it the fear of not knowing if tomorrow will arrive? <clears throat> or is that fantasy will become reality? With all the debate of, on potential nuclear war, I find the uncertainty reminding me of a depressing movie from the 80s being a little too familiar to the situation now. The only reason why I know about this movie is that I found a link on YouTube and decided to watch the movie to see what happened. I found myself watching the horrible events over and over leading to this essay. The movie is called When the Wind Blows, and for those not very aware of this film, the title Wind came from a nuclear blast. One of the most disturbing parts about watching this movie <clears throat> is that it was animated. Like someone wanted children to see it. And there were multiple animation styles highlighting the changes in attitudes of audience showing an odd past, present, and future. And so, while the movie came out in the 80s, the events take place a decade or two earlier when nuclear war was, was a very real possibility. And everyone was on edge so whenever someone reported Russia in the news. Now, with the war tensions with Russia and North Korea rising, I dread that there will be a demonstration of power on a simple area like Silva and there will be <clears throat> much for people to do for enduring the fallout. The problem is that people never expect disaster to happen because of being in an isolated area, where not much happens in, ge in general. And this leads to mistakes. There are plenty of character mistakes in the movie that starts filling me with fear because I wonder about my chances of survival if some nuclear event happens in a place like Asheville. And the movie takes place in the British countryside, one of the most beautiful places. In the movie, the man in the house, Jims, builds a fallout shelter, but not in the, but not in the cellar. It said, and it has supplies home for weeks in case help takes a while. The wife, Hilda, said, tends to cooking and cleaning like nothing is going to happen. Hilda has a peaceful uh, moment involving fairies to add to the obliviousness, and the use of colored pencils shows that this is a se separate world away from war. The change in animation style to me means that daydreams remain times of war taking away the coming blast. However, it also shows that not everyone believes that there's going to be even a small strike. There are a few brief <coughs> parts in the movie where there is a rocket, planes, and submarine all in crude CGI bathed in shadows showing the future of nuclear war had arrived. In the majority of the movie, it's like looking like a moving storybook, and it cuts to the dark CGI, you know that bad things are going to happen soon. When the bomb it hits in London and the blast sleeps over the sleepy countryside, demolishing cars, trains, and buildings, and said, the animation returns to the happy um, storybook style, style showing that everything is for real for everyone involved. But the shadowy CGI was real, things would have been much more real for the audience. If Russia or North Korea drops a bomb, there's nothing to do to block the attack. The same ruling destruction could come to our area, even with the mountains acting as shields. A nuke is still a nuke, and they're much stronger than the ones in the 50s, adding to the terror no matter where you are. I fear Trump is going to say something that prompts a response that comes out of nowhere, and there goes the planet. One nuclear attack is enough to ruin the satin life everywhere, because the fallout could end up anywhere with several strong winds. Chernobyl's fallout went all over Europe, and if someone starts a forest fire in the area, the world is doomed because no one thought it about the world as a whole. The late David Bowie composed the opening song of the same name, and two lines stick out at me. So long, child, I'm on my way, and so long, child, it's awful dark. Sound, sound a lot like reality, calling out for anyone almost grown. If the singer is fate, then I'm on my way is a part, isn't it, is adulthood and it can also be the choice uh, of to get a job or go to school, said, but with the payment of the military. The It's Awful Dark relates to how many 
don't know what lies in the future without a helping hand, anything can happen. Some people, once they turn 18, enlist not understanding that innocence is taken away and if war breaks out, all the happy memories are a place of blood and death. So, Wind can blow from any direction and contain many things, good and bad, affecting everyone in some way. The problem is it's hard to tell when the wind will blow and where it comes from. Soldiers today experience too much <clears throat> because once one long tour is over, another one begins for no reason other than a shortage of bodies. So without enough time to relax and vent, anyone can mistake friend for foe and need to further distrust in the military. Even though people need protection, the cost of innocent lives on both sides so it is, yeah, it, yeah, <clears throat> is, a, is that. And, and harsh truths that being a soldier involves more than a fancy uniform and marching. He said, war involves traveling to dangerous places looking for people that never harm anyone. But the bullets and bombs don't see any. In the movie, there are flashbacks, several being actual news footage. It's said to both World War One and World War Two. And that shows maneuvers and civilians adapting um, to life with the threat of enemy attacks. While there aren't any shots of combat, it's a, it sh showed how everyone Everyone um, was out of harm's way. Didn't and said didn't take things seriously, and this carries into the current situation in the movie and in real life. Unless there is an active war zone going on, no one really knows the horrors of war until it's on their doorstep. The easiest victory in war is to have others ignore how much chaos, real, how much chaos there really is. <laughs> and if a nuclear threat is hinted, not many people will go through the motions of going somewhere safe. One of my darker theories about the movie is that anyone watching is some kind of grim reaper because in addition to the normal animation there are sets of, made out of wood and the camera moves around. So the ch change to real life is upsetting because it's like watching anyone in the faded home like someone saying this could be you. After the blast hits all the debris is actual broken and burnt boards is a burnt glass and bits of fabric and to me, this is the actual outcome of surviving a nuclear blast. I said, in the real debris is another dark reality. Because there aren't, many, aren't any fourth wall breaks, it seems that every change in camera is death falling to doomed couple. Another element um, to the Grim Reaper taunting, the old couple occurs when every bit of water is gone and a single piece of candy remains. This too is a real object and even glinted when zoomed in on. When zoomed on, it shows that the end of the end is near when the last um, comfort is about to be consumed. The fear is enhanced by this time because the couple has grown thin and they barely get any rest due to chronic headaches on the set summits. The whole time you were watching the movie and you wanted to end because help is never coming for, for the couple and rolling credits are a welcome sign. If a nuke falls, then slowly dying from a lack of help is a very real possibility. There are a lot of people in the world and there are those who live far from town, and if Helps finds a way into these isolated areas, not everyone will be safe because of the distance from houses. A dying couple in the movie live on the edge of town, without, and without a way to call any sign of life for help, I said, and there are many houses in the area at the top of mountains, I said, with long winding roads that require a lot of practice, I said, for tr uh, to travel on without crashing. Oh, I said, all the crashing that comes from a nuclear shock wave will likely damage the roads along with isolated houses, and the residents will feel abandoned. In the end, poor Jim and Hilda realize that they're doomed, causing them to get in paper bags that become their body bags. There's a haunting song playing as Jim tries to pray, and we see billowing clouds showing that not only has the movie ended, but also has lives or blooded characters. The radiation sickness completed, <clears throat> and nothing that looks like hope or rescue to innocent lives are gone with the hopes that someone is almost there to fix things. When the wind blows points out that not everyone will be saved by the government in times of crisis. Smaller communities will be left to burn while the s while worse souls are pulled out pulled from the ashes in the cities. Even the most loyal soldiers will likely roam the aftermath full of good people gone too soon due to a poor government not planning every tiny detail in advance. Eventually, everyone gives up and waits for death, all the while wondering how things got so bad. 
<coughs> only to realize fate is cruel. on what this was exactly because I assumed it was just a poetry reading, not a personal poetry reading. So instead of reading something that I've written, this is just a poem by Pablo Neruda that I really, really enjoy. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this one is called Ode to Broken Things. Things get broken at home like they were pushed by an invisible, deliberate smasher. It's not my hands or yours. It wasn't the girls with their hard fingernails or the motion of the planet. It wasn't anything or anybody. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't the orange-colored noontime or night over the earth. It wasn't even the nose or the elbow or the hips getting bigger or the ankle or the air. The plate broke. The lamp fell. All the flower pots tumbled over one by one. The pot which overflowed with scarlet in the middle of October, it got tired from all of the violets, and another empty one rolled around and around and around all through winter until there was only powder of a flower pot, a broken memory, shining dust. And that clock, whose sound was the voice of our lives, the secret thread of our weeks, which released one by one so many hours for honey and silence, for so many births and jobs, that clock also fell and its delicate blue guts vibrated among the broken glass, its wide heart unsprung. Life goes on grinding up glass, wearing out clothes, making fragments, break down forms, and what lasts through it is like an island on a ship in the sea. Perishable, surrounded by dangerous fragility, by merciless waters and threats. Let's put all of our treasures together, the clocks, plates, cups cracked by cold into a sack, and carry them to the sea and let all of our possessions sink in one alarming breaker that may sound like the river. May whatever breaks be reconstructed by the sea, with the long labor of its tides, so many useless things which nobody broke, but which got broken anyway. Thank you. Shining 
they hate out the period of the hood that yeah. And she goes for all what he yeah. And it's not true to make the usual noise. And it's hard for to in the afternoon than the three of all. And they should once again show the magic of the Creator. Then, after a few minutes, the process is reversed and the moment forward back of the hot sun and you turn to a rock of blood and the guy is normal again.